Hello and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. I'm Stephen Burns, the Medical Co-Director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System. The forums, the video recordings, and our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Tonight's presentation on protecting your shoulders and staying active after spinal cord injury. Our speaker, Kristen Kopang, physical therapist in the Rehabilitation Medicine Outpatient Clinic at Harborview Medical Center. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Now please welcome our speaker, Kristen Kopang. Okay, thank you guys for coming tonight. I'm excited to be here. Um, I am a physical therapist at Harborview, like Dr. Byrne says. I've been a therapist for 16 years now. The past 11 years I've been working primarily in the neurological rehab, both inpatient and outpatient, so dealing a lot with spinal cord injury and a lot with shoulder pain. So it's uh, definitely something I see pretty regularly, uh, either daily or weekly uh, in our clinic, and I'm sure you guys deal with it daily or weekly at home yourselves. So hopefully today I'll be able to give you some background, some review of the research, some ideas and some strategies on how you can really protect your shoulders and stay healthy, not only you know, today, but as you're aging with your spinal cord injury. So the objectives today, I want you to, at the end of the presentation, I would like to see you guys be able to recognize the changing function and impact on shoulders after a spinal cord injury, to be able to identify the key structures in the shoulder complex and strategies to protect the shoulder after spinal cord injury, to demonstrate basic stretching and strengthening exercises to facilitate preservation of shoulder function, and to demonstrate positions or environmental adaptations that will help to preserve your shoulder health. So as you all know, the, there's a lot of changing roles of all muscles after spinal cord injury. When you think about uh, the spinal cord injury for a complete injury, you now have somebody that's relying completely on their upper extremities for what their legs used to do. That's a lot of pressure, a lot of weight on the shoulders, which tend to be the joint that takes the brunt of that impact. For incomplete injuries, when you have somebody that has altered strength or altered sensation, they may use their muscles a little bit differently or it's a little bit less efficient. So you're not doing them in the same pattern as you were used to doing the exercises or the activities before. And so you have these abnormal stresses on your shoulder. And over time, these abnormal stresses could potentially cause pain or could cause discomfort. And the shoulders themselves are an extremely flexible joint. Um, the, with the ball and socket arrangement of the shoulder, it gives you a really infinite number of directions that the shoulder can move. You can see baseball pitchers you know, go in a full windmill circle. Um, and we think about the shoulder sometimes as sort of having this endless amount of range of motion, which is great for function in some ways, but it also allow, it, it sort of precludes you to getting an injury or potentially sort of putting it at risk because there's so many ligaments, there's so many tendons, there's so many muscles that sort of go surrounding that shoulder capsule to keep it protected um, that we really have to be careful not to push it to its end ranges of motion all the time and not to always, you know, utilize that entire um, flexibility within the joint. The other interesting thing about the shoulder is that it's very dependent on the scapula or your shoulder blade as well as your trunk. So movements within the trunk are going to affect the shoulder and the ability to move your scapula has a huge impact on how you're um, moving your shoulder itself. So we'll talk a little bit about that relationship as we're going on. And as you know, paralysis mandates an increased demand on the shoulders, not only in transfers, but in sitting balance at times, carrying items or objects, propulsion of the wheelchair, and pressure relief, just to name a few of them. As many of you probably, how many in the audience here have had shoulder pain at some point in their injury? So I think we've had that's probably pretty close to what the average, closer to the 70% prevalence. Um, you know, you're pretty close to three out of four spinal cord injury um, individuals will have shoulder pain in the duration of their spinal cord injury throughout their life. Um, that's a really high percentage, and that could be even higher. We don't really know how they're reporting all this. You could have minor shoulder pain that maybe the doctor didn't know about or they didn't get reported onto a study. So even the smallest amount of pain is something that you guys need to pay attention to or something we have to address early on to prevent it from getting any worse. It's been shown in the research that the incidence or the amount of shoulder pain increases over time after you have a spinal cord injury. Um, and then it also, in 1991, one of the studies showed that it was the only factor that was identified with a lower quality of life score. So having shoulder pain made the individuals feel like they didn't have as good of a quality of life as if they didn't have shoulder pain and were able to get around a little bit more. The study was in 1991, so there might be other studies that are, are no longer, this might not be the unique feature anymore, 
um, but it's definitely a pretty high priority in the ability to do the things that you want to do uh, throughout your day. So how do you protect and how do you preserve your shoulders? And you guys have probably heard lots of different strategies and lots of different techniques throughout your rehab, throughout outpatient, friends, family, you know, just as sort of going along with your um, daily activities. I'm going to go over four different areas today or four different sort of topics um, and try to give you ideas within each of them that you could either modify part of your activity at home or give you ideas of how to be able to um, adapt things that you're doing right now. So the first category would be rest or stopping the use of the painful extremity, to modify the task performance, to modify the environment of the task being performed, and then to strengthen and to maintain flexibility. The last one will be the biggest one that we talk about and certainly more in my domain of being uh, a physical therapist looking at strength and flexibility. So the first category of resting and stopping the use of a painful extremity. So it's pretty much impossible. <laughs> As you guys know, everything that you do you're using your shoulders. When you get out of bed, when you're rolling, when you're sitting, when you're able to transfer, it's almost impossible to stop complete use of the, the upper extremity unless you go on bed rest where you have a full caregiver support and that's not really all that practical for, for anybody and it may not be really an option for people. So partial rest, how could you decrease your activity? To so think about different ways that you could slowly sort of relax your shoulders or give them a break throughout the day. One would be decreased frequency of movements that cause pain. So if you know you have to reach for something in a cabinet and it takes you a while to position really close or really um, comfortably to be able to get that, get everything you need out of that cabinet at one time. Do it once or plan ahead or you know, utilize your caregiver support for the tasks that you think are difficult for your shoulder or they may cause pain that you're able to get some help with. You also can use your non-dominant hand for any activity. Um, that you're capable of doing. So even the simple task of eating, say you're right, you're right hand dominant and your right shoulder is the one that has quite a bit of pain, just taking a spoon in your left hand and trying to feed yourself with your left hand gives you a break with your right shoulder. It's one less thing that you have to do during the day that's impacting that shoulder. That's a pretty minor change, but could you do opening the door with your left hand versus your right hand if your you know, right hand is a, or your right shoulder is a little bit injured or impaired? So thinking about the activities that you can actually change or alter or using your strengths to be able to switch, um, to, to decrease the amount of pain in your shoulder. <clears throat> so positioning is a really important one as well. Um, and I'm going to just sort of give a caveat. There's a couple pictures here that are recommended. These are from the uh, spinal cord injury um, clinical practice guidelines that are dealing with preservation of upper extremity function. If you guys don't have a copy of the Preservation of Upper Extremity Function Guidelines. It is on the website from the uh, National Spinal Cord Injury Association. It's a great read. It's really important. And I think a lot of these pictures are coming from here. But they're not going to be ideal for everybody. These are going to be sort of like exactly what you are hoping to get towards, but you may not be able to be completely on your back. You may not be able to be completely on your side. You're going to have to modify a little bit based on your injury and based on your comfort level and how you're doing. So. When I think about positioning of the shoulder in bed, if you're lying on your back, if your arms are down by your side, um, you're in what I call internal rotation. So your arm is sort of rotated in to the side like this. Once you're turned in, you close off the space of your shoulder. I like to call this, a, you know, this position of your shoulder when I have my hand out, I consider this what I call an open pack position of the shoulder. So I have more space for all the tendons, all the nerves, all the blood vessels coming through here. As soon as I rotate my shoulder in, I have less space and there's more chance of things sort of pinching. So sleeping with your hands rotated in is not a great position. How can you get closer to this open position? One of them is this position here that you see over on the right side of your screen is having your arm behind you, but not all the way back because that's going to put a lot of stress on your shoulder, but put it a little bit on a pillow so you're able to get some support. You get a little bit of stretch through your shoulder while you're sleeping. Um, that so hopefully will help to sort of decrease the pain. If, you're, if this is your painful shoulder, then you may not be able to tolerate that position. Maybe you'd only be able to tolerate your arm out to the side a little bit, you know, and not completely all the way back. So you have to sort of modify, you know, where you're going based on your level of pain. The lower picture is another example. So his right arm on the side is very similar to the right arm on the pillow here, and then the other arm is just out to the side 
again, in an open position, opening up the shoulder joint versus closing the shoulder joint coming down here. Even this position with both hands out to the side would be better than both hands down here at your sides because you're keeping your shoulders open, you're getting nice blood flow, good nutrition through the joint. The question was why wouldn't you want to have both arms up or both arms in this 90 degree position? There's no reason why you couldn't. Um, again, it's based on whether you're comfortable or whether you're able to tolerate that position and that helps to relieve some of the pressure in the shoulders. So yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> the question was if you have somebody sleeping next to you um, and you're not able to sleep in this sort of, you know, open position where you're going to be hitting the person next to you, what would you do? What would be the next best alternative? You know, certainly you could come up here if you have enough space. It's better than being way out to the side. But also just sort of getting your shoulder elevated just a little bit and supporting it on a pillow would be better than, again, that closed position at the, at the shoulder. So for sleeping on your side, um, you can see here you're going to have a pillow on your side for your upper arm, so you're sort of hugging a pillow. And again, with hugging the pillow, you get opening in the shoulder joint. You don't have that closed position. You don't have it really nice and tight through here. You have it a little bit open. It's allowed to um, move a little bit easier. And you don't want to be completely on your lower arm. So a lot of people are really tender to sleep on a painful shoulder. And you don't want to be sleeping directly on your shoulder, so perpendicular to the bed. You want to have a little bit of rotation so your shoulder is out a little bit so it's not stuck underneath you. Okay? So pillow on this side, and then you can have a pillow to rest your arm on the opposite side as well. Um, and you can see, and this is obviously really important for pressure relief as well, that you're changing position throughout the night. That also helps your shoulders. Keeping your shoulders in one position for eight hours in a row, you're going to wake up a little bit uncomfortable. I think everybody would wake up slightly uncomfortable if you're sort of stuck in one position the whole time. So if you can rotate every three to four hours, I think is a good, good target to be able to change your position. On your stomach is another good position to rest. Um, and again, you want to keep your shoulders in an open position, not in a closed position. So having your arms you know, a little bit further away from your body and having one arm sort of up to the side here. Using pillows, using supports, whatever you can to sort of modify your sleeping environment. Okay, so again, when you're able to rest, positioning is still important, so sitting. Um, we talked a little bit about this open pack position of your shoulders. Same thing with sitting. I don't want to be sitting with my arms crossed all the time or sort of tucked in. I'm keeping my shoulders in this tight position. Certainly this is a very comfortable position for a lot of people. You rest your arms on a desk, you, you know, do a lot of things in, you know, in this position, but if you're able to and it's not impacting your function, try to keep your arms out to the side. You keep a little bit better stretch, you keep your, your joint mo moving a little bit, and you prevent it from getting into this pinched sort of state. Um, the other thing that you can do while you're sitting is really think about your shoulder blades. As your shoulder blades are working, if you pull your shoulder blades together, like you're pinching them together in the back, so squeezing your shoulders back, you're helping to open up that position of your shoulders. As soon as your body starts to hunch forward or your posture slumps, your shoulders get in that closed position again, and it's really hard to get them moving. For everybody that can right now, I want you guys to just slump in your chairs. Or slump down as much as you can. And then I want you to raise one arm. Okay, and now I want you to sit up with the best posture that you possibly have ever seen in your life and raise the same arm. So it's a lot easier, right? So you get a lot more motion. You're able to sort of do more if you have good posture. So a good base of support is essential for shoulder function. If you're sitting slumped in your chair, if you don't have any good support sort of on your lumbar or your, your pelvis, you could easily decrease the amount of shoulder movement you have and cause your shoulders to work harder. So positioning is really important. If you haven't had you know, an evaluation of your seating and positioning, I think that would be an essential thing to make sure that you're optimizing that motion. So changing the task performance to reduce the forces on the shoulder joint. So transfers, obviously, are one of the biggest things that you guys do that impacts the shoulders. Um, and transfers are essential. You need to be able to get in and out of bed. You need to be able to get in and out of a car. Um, every sort of movement that you're, you're doing could be, during a transfer, is really putting a lot of weight on your shoulders. Your hand placement is very important with transfers. Do you guys know what I would say for the hand position? Where would it be? 
open. <laughs> so almost everything is going to be coming to this open position. So you don't want to do a transfer with your arms really rotated in because you have a chance of pinching um, sort of the other structures that come into that anterior shoulder. So as much as you're able to, you want to rotate your hand out about 30 to 45 degrees before you do your transfer as you're doing. You're setting your position, you're allowing your shoulder to stay a little bit in a looser position. Um, if you have shoulder pain and you're doing transfers that are doing a lift up and over and it hurts halfway through the motion and for all the rest of the motion, another idea would be to use a sliding board and make smaller motions. Be more efficient with your motions and not exacerbate that pain. You can sort of do a strategy to get yourself over just a little bit at a time. You want to avoid extreme positions. So if I'm doing a transfer and I'm reaching my arm way over here and then trying to push, you're going to put stress on that shoulder. Anything you can do to position your chair better, anything you can do to position your body better, to allow yourself to sort of avoid that extreme motion is going to be important. The other thing that's been shown is you want to lead with your um, arm that's experiencing shoulder pain if you have pain and if you're able to, if your position or environment sets that up. And the reason is the serratus anterior, which is a muscle that does a lot of depression or sort of this lift motion, is shown to have more force in the trailing arm than in the leading arm. So the leading arm does less work and there's less force applied through the shoulder of the leading arm than there is with the trailing arm. So you can, again, decrease the impact on the painful shoulder by leading with the arm that's or that is painful. Certainly using your momentum is important with transfers and then leaning your trunk forward as much as you're able to. So if you guys can think of the number of transfers that you do in a day, multiply that by the year, and then by the, the lifespan, transfers are a huge part of your ability to stay independent. If you're able to keep yourself to be able to transfer independently or safely or without pain, you're really going to allow yourself to, to sort of keep that quality of life, that independence that you want to be able to have. So the more that you can protect your shoulders while you're doing this, the more you preserve the ability to be able to continue your transfers to continue to weight bear through those shoulders. So modifying task performance. Um, pressure reliefs. How many of you guys do pressure reliefs? Hopefully everybody's raising their hand. Um, pressure reliefs, when I first started working in physical therapy, we told everybody that could to do the big press up. You know, full depression, lift all the way up, hold it for a minute, you know, really make sure that you're getting your, your body up and you get full clearance of your buttocks so you have no pressure on your buttocks. And it's still a great technique to be, relieve the pressure off your buttocks, but it's really putting a lot of weight and a lot of strain on your shoulders. So if you're doing pressure release every 15 to 20 minutes, which is the recommended, and no, probably not everybody's doing that all the time, you're really putting a lot of stress on your shoulders by just doing pressure release. So maybe do a full release at one, one session and then the next 15 minutes you're doing a lateral lean or a forward lean. You can see in the pictures here when you're leaning to the side you're able to get one butt cheek completely off, loaded from the pressure, and then you would have to then go over to the other side. So you need to increase the amount of time that you're doing it uh, rather than just sort of a straight lift because you can only get one side at a time, but it's still effective. And in order to test it at home you can just have somebody sort of reach their hand up and underneath. Can you, can you feel any space between your buttocks and the seat cushion? Is that effective for pressure relief? Um, carrying objects, I know sometimes this is a hard, hard thing to do to carry anything while you're pushing a wheelchair certainly, um, but having things closer to your body are, is easier than having things further away. So if you're holding something and holding it with an outstretched arm, you put a lot of weight through your shoulder, you put a lot of torque on your shoulder. If you bring the item closer to you, you're going to be a lot less painful, a lot less work to your shoulder joint. And then not reaching overhead or pulling yourself onto like a trapeze or a bar. That often that puts you into this internal rotation position, closes up the shoulder joint, and makes it sort of hard to, to get yourself out of that painful position. So this is for, for manual wheelchair mobility. Certainly this is um, something that you can work on as well to decrease your shoulder pain as you're propelling or to preserve your shoulder function so you can continue to propel. Long smooth strokes, very important. And making sure that your contact point is at 11 o'clock and releasing at 2 o'clock. 
So you don't want to start straight up at the top of the, of the tire. You want to go be a little bit behind and you want to be able to push smoothly and efficiently forward and then lightly release, not quickly sort of pull back. So it's a nice, gentle, efficient stroke. So as your hand sort of releases the wheel, your, your, your thumb drops down and just sort of, you know, is, is light. It's not grabbing as you're coming back. You don't want to be pressing on the push rims really tightly. You don't want to get force this way. Again, as soon as I've got my shoulders this way, I'm turning my shoulder in and I'm putting force, you know, through there that's could potentially cause problems down the road. Um, another strategy is if you lose momentum and you're on a slope or an incline, instead of forcing your shoulders to do it as hard as you can, as fast as you can, take a break, turn your chair sideways, see if you can get a little bit of a rest, ask for help um, getting up and down some of those inclines. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was finding a rest position for your arms in the chair. I think this is important. I've had a couple of clients that have been really unsteady with their balance that they've needed to use their hands to support their trunk. So their hands always have to be in contact with something to be able to sit upright. And that's really hard. Because if you're sitting in your chair for 12 hours a day and your body is on or your muscles are working for that 12 hours, they're going to be fatigued. They're going to wear out quicker. You're going to have a harder time sort of performing and doing other tasks. So if your positioning is such that you're required to hold yourself up with your hands, then we really need to look at your positioning to see if we can get that better so you have your hands free to be able to move around and to be able to relax at the times when you don't need to use your hands. Having them on armrests, having them on your lap, and again, if, you, you know, if you're able to throughout the day, it's just sort of opening up your shoulders a little bit. And the same for power wheelchair users, keeping your arms away from your body, you know, trying to stretch them out a little bit when you're in a power tilt, having them lean off to the side is helpful to sort of open up that shoulder joint to allow you to sort of keep, um, hopefully prevent too much pain through that shoulder. So height of transfer surface is another one. I think you guys probably have all experienced this with the, you have a high transfer or getting down onto a floor. It puts a lot more strain on your shoulders than if you have either an even or what I consider a downhill surface. So if you're able to set up your environment that you're going downhill more often than you're going steep uphill, Again, you, you give yourself the advantage of decreasing the amount of work that your shoulders have to do throughout the day, hopefully, therefore, protecting and preserving your shoulder, shoulder health. Um, of course, you can't really do that with your bed. If you have your bed, that it's not, if it's not a hospital bed, it's either going to be higher or lower getting in or getting out. So you know, maybe making that an even transfer surface if you're able to. If it is a hospital bed and you're able to get it low enough to get in and lift it up and high, high to get out, that that would be ideal to be able to do. Keeping things accessible to you, keeping things that you use quite frequently in close proximity or in close reach so you're not having to struggle to get any sort of accessible item. Also minimizing difficult terrain so on day where your shoulder is painful or if you do have any shoulder pain, going up and down the hills of Seattle is probably not a great idea. Finding a way to get around, finding a way to sort of, you know, avoid some of these really difficult uh, terrain. And then the other, the last thing about manual chairs is that your tire inflation is really, really important to the amount of effort that you use to push the chair. So if your tire inflation is poor, if it's really low, you're using more force to push your chair, which translates to more strain on your shoulders, which makes it more difficult to be able to get around. So make, maintaining your chair, making sure your chair is in good working order, I would usually recommend checking the tire inflation about once a week. You can also do that just sort of with feeling, just sort of seeing how it, how it feels as you're rolling. The lower the tire pressure, the increasing, you increase the rolling resistance. So you increase the friction between your tire and the floor, which makes it harder to push the chair around. Okay. Any questions about sort of environment or changing task performance or positioning? Before we dive into the strengthening and stretching? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is... Um, if you have uh, difficulty keeping yourself upright and you're always using your hands to support yourself, is it important to put armrests back on your wheelchair? And I don't think it, it's an essential to put your armrests back on unless your armrests prevent you from doing that or give you that position that you can rest in. If you feel like it's causing you pain throughout the day because your hands are always touching something that aren't your armrests, then I think it would be a good, good, good trial you know, to do. 
So the question is about sort of, you know, how to relieve back pain and how to sort of relieve whether or not using your shoulders and sort of supporting yourself is causing some of that pain. And it certainly could contribute to it. Um, I would think that, you know, the first thing that you'd want to do is really look at your positioning in the chair. Is there anything that you can do to change your backrest position to either support you better or to decrease some of the pain in your back? And then certainly talking a little bit about some of the movements and maybe some of the stretching that we're going to go over here in just a little bit. It's a good question. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is these, these four articles here are sort of the um, four primary articles that are out in the research right now that talk about exercise and spinal cord injury and relate it to pain. Um, most of these studies used what's called the Wheelchair Users Shoulder Pain Index, which is a fancy uh, research tool that sort of basically quantifies the amount of pain that people are having with daily activities. So some of the questions would be, are you having shoulder pain when you are transferring, you know, and then you give it a, a level or an intensity level. So it, it gives you a score that shows you how much shoulder pain you have, um, uh, you know, on this scale. So the studies are, um, well, I'll go through each of them a as we're going here. The first study is by Curtis, and he showed um, 42 different wheelchair users and divided them up in between two different groups. And the two different groups, one of them was a group that just received education. So somebody talked about the shoulder, sort of like we're doing tonight, and then they were given um, exercises that they were supposed to do. Um, and then this other group was doing a little bit more of a controlled study, so they were actually being helped through some of these exercises. And they got exercises for stretching and for strengthening. And these exercises were for the pectoralis major, which is the muscle that's right here on your chest. This is the muscle that's in the front. The pectoralis muscle does the most work when you're transferring. So it's a very important muscle to one be able to use. So that, that muscle they wanted to be able to stretch, as well as your biceps. And your biceps also do quite a bit of work throughout the day and are often in a bent position instead of the stretch position, which is straight out. The strengthening exercises that they chose were scapular retraction. And what that means is that you're bringing your shoulder blades or your scapula closer together. Shoulder external rotation or ER, which is you're rotating your shoulders out. That's dealing with the rotator cuff. And then shoulder adduction or meaning this direction sort of towards your body. And this is the motion or this is the action that the pectoralis major does. So this, this position is sort of strengthens that being. So they took their, um, they chose muscles to stretch that are in the front of the body primarily, and they chose muscles that are in the back of the body to strengthen. And I think that's a very typical theme of all of these exercises. I'm going to compare which muscles they chose for each exercise and talk about which ones maybe would be important for you guys to choose or how we would choose differently uh, for each individual. What they showed in this study was that they had decreased shoulder pain and improved activity in the exercise group, but it wasn't statistically significant. So it couldn't sort of prove that by doing these exercises, you're definitely going to have less pain. It sort of showed a trend, but not a really strong result. This next study only had seven participants, which is a pretty low number of participants. But these uh, individuals were seen in a four-month circuit training program. They all had spinal cord injury in the thoracic region. And they actually used um, machines or Nautilus equipment to be able to do these, uh, this protocol. So they would do two minutes of arm ergometry, meaning they're doing two minutes of bicycling with their arms. And then they're doing two minutes of resistance exercises. They had six exercises. You would do two exercises the first time. Then you would go back and do two minutes of bicycling, two more exercises, two minutes of bicycling, two more exercises. It was a routine that they did. So they had a alternating between resistance and cardiovascular endurance. And then they repeated that cycle three times. What they showed in the study was that there was a reduction of shoulder pain during the daily activities and a noted improvement in, in strength and endurance. But with a study size of only seven people, it's really hard to sort of make that a powerful study to be able to translate to everybody. So it showed good results, but it was such a small sample size, it's hard to really generalize. But again, the muscles that they chose were primarily the muscles that are used during transfers or the muscles that are more on the posterior side of the body. The next study was probably one of the biggest ones that came out was in 2006. And this one had 41 individuals and they were assigned in, into an intervention group or an asymptomatic group. Asymptomatic meaning they don't have any pain at all. So they were just sort of divided between those two. 
<clears throat> they were given an exercise pamphlet and they were strengthening their trapezius muscle. The trapezius muscle, the middle and the lower trapezius is sort of in the middle of your back, right in here. And the action that it does is pulls the shoulder blades together. So it squeezes those shoulder blades together. They also do, did the serratus anterior, which is a muscle that sits on the underside of your shoulder blade. And it does this sort of extra push that you guys need sometimes at the end of a transfer to get that final lift up there. And then they did the shoulder external rotators, so this moving out to the side or trying to get their arms, the rotator cuff muscles they were strengthening. For stretching, they stretched the upper trapezius, which is right through here, which is sort of what you were talking a little bit about, was this is a tight, tense muscle all the time. It's very tight on a lot of people. They also stretched the long head of the biceps, so the biceps being the muscle that's sort of here in your forearm that's doing a lot of lifting. It crosses both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. It helps a little bit with shoulder flexion. So we stretched that one. And then they stretched the posterior capsule. And what the posterior capsule means is when we talked about this sort of ball and socket joint of the shoulder, not only was there muscles surrounding it and ligaments, but they had sort of a, a cartilaginous capsule that sort of protects it and keeps it in place that sometimes can get a little bit tighter, a little bit stiff. So you get adhesions in there that makes it hard to sort of move your humerus back and forth within the shoulder joint itself. So there's some capsular stretches that they did. And what they showed was that they had a, you know, really good improvements on this, this WUSPI is the wheelchair user shoulder pain index. So they showed improvements on that, which they were pleased about, uh, and decreased pain and increased function as well as increased satisfaction. So this was, a, this was a great study. This is the exercises that they did uh, during the study. You can see on the left-hand side is the stretches. So they use the upper trapezius muscle. When we think about the muscles, and the reason that I'm sort of pointing to where exactly the muscles are, I think it's important to think about a stretch as a lengthening of the muscle. So the reason that the muscle is tight is because it's often in a shortened position. If you're, if you're tense, if you're tight, if you're fighting, sort of holding your balance, your upper trapezius shortens. It gets stiff. It gets tight. Sometimes it gets knots in it. Thinking about getting your shoulders down, getting this muscle to stretch as much as you can, just by leaning your head to the side, opening this up. You can do this yourself. You can have a caregiver help you with this. You have a little bit of overpressure. The other thing you can do is even grab down with your opposite hand towards a chair and hold on for a little extra force. You get a nice stretch through the upper trapezius muscle, which is a muscle that is often tight in a lot of people. Their pectoralis stretch, and again, the pectoralis is here on the chest. It's one of the largest muscles in the chest. If you're sitting in this position, you shorten that muscle. You make it condense. You sort of make it really stiff and tight. So you want to open that muscle up. This, what they did on this one was that they are holding sort of onto a door. And so they're, they're coming up against the door and leaning and allowing that, that stretch to happen. You could do it on two doors. You could do it on one door. You could do it in a power tilt by just opening up your arms this way. Um, you could do it in bed, just sort of opening up so you're not sort of curled up in this position. Those are all different stretches that you can do for your pectoralis muscle. The long head of the biceps, you can see they're stretching sort of the front part of the arm. And again, they have it up against a sort of a block or a, uh, a, a hard surface and then leaning forward to be able to stretch that. Again, that's also stretched if you're opening your arms up a little bit and bending your wrist back or, or loosening up in that direction. And then the posterior capsule stretch, they're sort of pushing back and forth between the capsule. Um, <clears throat> you can see that his left arm is sort of pushing back on the right side of the capsule to try to loosen that up a little bit. It looks a little bit like this. You're sort of going back and forth this way to stretch the capsule. And then the strengthening exercises on this side, um, again, they worked with the middle and the lower trapezius. Um, and the first two examples are ways that you can strengthen that muscle, which is sort of moving into the scap, bringing your sh shoulder blades together. Um, the serratus anterior, where you're doing a little bit of punching, sort of really extending out. And then this external rotation. And I'm going to go over some different techniques that we can do some of these exercises with uh, towards the end. So this is what uh, Dr. Nalazinski did for her study, and these were the results that they showed for improved um, or decreased pain and improved function. The most recent study just came out last year, and it's called the STOMPS trial. 
um, it's strengthening of muscles after spinal cord injury. And what they did was they looked at uh, uh, individuals that had a spinal cord injury for at least five years that were having some sort of shoulder pain and that they used a manual wheelchair for about 50% of the time. There was 80 individuals in this group and they were randomized into two different groups. One of them was an exercise group that really focused on movement and really looking at sort of the quality of movement. And one of the groups was like a just attention control group. So they were given almost a sham type of treatment. So they were just given an hour instruction on a video and, and a handout. But so they didn't really get any of the, the treatment. And they were sort of comparing these two groups of what they were able to get. The exercise movement group, um, you were instructed by a PT in a 12-week exercise program for home. And the goal was to optimize transfers, depression raises, and wheelchair propulsion. You were given handouts, and then you were sort of keeping an activity log or a daily calendar. And then you were doing your, your strengthening for three times a week. And they divided it up into different categories. And this is the first study that looked at hypertrophy exercises versus endurance exercises. So what that means is hypertrophy meaning exercises that are giving you muscle bulk or making your muscle big. Sort of like you think about when you're bodybuilding. You want to get those muscles in hypertrophy. You want to get them big and bulky. And then there's some muscles that you want to be able to use all day long, really efficiently, really well. And those are more endurance based. So they had separated these out to the hypertrophy muscle being external rotation, so your rotator cuff muscles, as well as your pectoralis major, which is this diagonal adduction position. It was an interesting choice to me. I think, you know, knowing that the pectoralis major is the primary muscle in the transfer, it's certainly important to make that muscle as strong as you can to be able to move. But I have a little bit of hesitation to give a lot of people this strengthening exercise because it puts them in what position? This closed position. So I think about it as trying to strengthen that. In, in my mind, I would rather strengthen the upper trapezius muscle, or sorry, the pectoralis muscle in, in a functional position. How am I doing with the transfer? How can I utilize it with the transfer? And that could be because some of the patients that I've had just succeeded more with that. And I think some of them, I'll probably try this technique and to be able to see if they're able to sort of utilize that. But you may want to try it in an endurance position instead of a hypertrophy position if you're having a lot of impingement problems. Um, and they also gave them a number of list of recommendations for um, transfers. And I think in your handouts, one of the last pages is a recommendation list that they gave for this study. It was sort of a lot of the stuff that we went over was recommendations for how to change position and what to do, what to look at at home. So here's where the stretches that they were doing. Um, so this is the anterior shoulder joint. You can see he was doing it the same way. He's stretching the pectoralis major. He's really opening up the shoulder joint, um, keeping his arms out to the side. You can do it one at a time. Or again, like we talked about, you can do it in a power tilt. Coming across the body, stretching the posterior muscles, and then the upper trapezius stretch, which is what we talked about the first one. So the stretches were fairly similar in both of these studies. And these were the exercises. The one on the left-hand side are the ones that they were doing to build muscle strength and muscle size. And then the ones on the right they're doing to build endurance. So reaching above, pulling down, holding, and rotating out are the two that are used for a lot of muscle force, a lot of muscle strength. Where there's two that are endurance-based, they were doing this direction and a pulling back like a, a shoulder, like a rowing position. So what they found overall was that they reduced shoulder pain within the intervention group um, and not the sham group, which sort of makes sense. And um, it didn't significantly impact physical activity, but it did help to improve quality of life and their social roles um, in the community. So on top of these studies, we have the Academy of Sports Medicine. And certainly, the Academy of Sports Medicine is putting out guidelines for exercise for everybody not just individuals with disability or not just able-bodied individuals. So we have to keep into, if we were trying to pull these all together and try to sort of sort through what everybody is telling us to do, how do we make the decision on what's important for you? And I think it's important to pull in the Academy of Sports Medicine guidelines because they really talk about both endurance exercise as well as strengthening as well as flexibility. And we haven't really talked about endurance that much during this session and I think it's going to be a whole other lecture <laughs> to be able to go through some you know, cardiovascular fitness and, and healthy activities for endurance, for wellness. Um, the shoulder is just such a huge topic that you can
talk forever on this, I think, as you're going. So the, the academy talks about doing different levels of intensity of exercise a few days a week. Um, and then you have to combine both strengthening and flexibility exercises. There's not one of them up there that says that you need to do it seven days a week. And I think that's important. I think sometimes a barrier to exercise is people don't want to do it because they don't feel like they can do it all the time or every single day. If you're able to do strengthening or stretching three to five days a week, you're following the guidelines of what the Academy of Sports Medicine is recommending for everybody. Their guidelines for individuals with spinal cord injury are almost are, are identical, except the only thing that they do is that they sort of make considerations. They just want to make sure that you're aware of your body parameters based on your spinal cord injury. So if you get dysreflexic, um, monitoring your heart rate, if you have any trouble with that, monitoring your temperature, and if you have any tenodesis or change of hand function that you need to preserve, you want to protect that. So what do you do? So what do you listen to? How do you choose? So the way that I would choose, or the way that I would go about choosing this for my own program would be, which muscles in my body are shortened right now? Which muscles, based on my body position, based on how I'm sitting in this chair, how I transfer, how I may have been before the injury occurred, do I need to stretch and be able to lengthen to keep it in an optimal position? And most of the time, those muscles are going to be here on the front. Even, you know, I, I can see myself oftentimes sitting and teaching some of my clients, and I'm like, you got to really have good posture, you got to sit up. And, you know, I have to remind myself to get up just to sort of sit up tall. And I'm shortening these muscles, easily get tension through here. So really thinking about making sure you're flexible in your neck, in the anterior part of your chest, and your arms. So in general, um, as far as strengthening goes, the muscles that move the scapula, or sort of move the scapula shoulder blade side to side and up and down, and stabilize it, have the greatest amount of force uh, throughout the day. So those are the muscles you're probably going to want to strengthen. And we'll talk about which ones they are as we're going. For transfers, the muscles that we talked about during the study were the serratus, the pectoralis, and the latissimus, which does a little bit of extension. And then wheelchair propulsion, again, the pectoralis is in all three of those categories. Again, very important muscle to be able to maintain. So to compare the three studies, you can see these are the exercises that they did for each group. And they changed the number of repetitions, the frequency, the duration, all of that is different for every single study. And there's no one set prescription of how you want to do that. Um, so when I look at these and I pull out which ones are common, they're going to be the upper trapezius muscle that you want to stretch, that we talked about. So this is primary stretch, is sort of leaning over to the side, holding, and feeling that sort of tension through there. The pectoralis major, opening up the chest. You can do it in a doorway. You can do it one at a time. You can do it laying down on bed and just sort of having your arms out to the side. Or you could do it on the edge of the bed and have one arm over the side to get a little bit more extension uh, to be able to open that up some more. The long head of the biceps, which is this front part of your, your forearm here. It's doing a lot of lifting. It's doing a lot of work when you're Compelling. Um, you want to keep that open. Long head of the biceps, you're just going to stretch. In this position, you can often have it up against the door and leaning forwards or moving your body away from the support surface. And again, the exercises are listed in your handout, so hopefully, I'm not going too quickly through all of these. Hopefully, you'll be able to so identify some of the ones that we're talking about through here. And then capsular stretches, I think, are also important. And when I think about that, one of the easiest ways to do that is really just think about moving your shoulder around. So like going back and forth with your shoulder, up and down, keeping the joint moving and not just by moving your arm. So really making your shoulder do some movement to keep that nice and loose lubricated. Yeah, she's asking if you can do a circle as well as this up and down and back and forth. Absolutely. Um, you can do the circle and what I would emphasize is more the downward motion in the circle than the upward motion. Because the upward motion, you often pull in your upper trap, which is already tight. So you're thinking about pushing down, moving back and forth. So these are the muscles, the anterior muscles of the um, shoulder complex. And these are the stretches that we would do for those um, that we just sort of talked about. The next one would be, so when we compare the strengthening exercises, um, you can see that there have also a number of similarities in this. Scapular retraction, I think, is the number one and the primary 
um, exercise that you want to be doing. Thinking about the posterior muscles, pulling back, squeezing your shoulder blades together, trying to find a way to sort of really get your body more upright to keep your chest open. If you're strengthening the muscles in, the, in your back, around your shoulder blade, you're really able to control your posture a little bit better. You prevent yourself from slumping because those muscles get a little bit more taut, a little bit more tense, and they don't sort of collapse and open up like this. So really working anything you can do with your upper back or the back of your shoulder, very, very important uh, for exercise. External rotation is another thing that's sort of working those posterior muscles. So thinking about rotating your arms out to the side, you can do it fairly easily with you know, a TheraBand, rotating this way, sort of pulling out, stabilizing. You could have this hooked onto one side of a door and rotate out to the side. Same thing you know, over to the other side. Um, you could have somebody resisting you. You could do it yourself, getting through that act active motion, if that's enough to sort of keep your, your, your body um, strengthened. Um, and then diagonal extension, so this using the pectoralis major, which is a muscle that we're needing to use for transfers. Um, you're doing an overhead or like a pull down. So you could have one of these bands sort of hooked up on a door or on a, on a hook up in the ceiling or near, you know, near the ceiling and, and sort of pull it down. I'm not able to really demonstrate here, but it's a, you, you want to do that in a sort of a diagonal motion. And then bringing your arm up. So scaption is sort of a, I think fancy word for bringing, bringing your shoulder up <laughs> or lifting your arm up. And the reason that they call it scaption is because it's elevation or movement of the arm in the plane of the scapula. So the way that the shoulder blade sits, it sort of angles out, you know, away from, it's not sort of, it's not perpendicular uh, or it doesn't come this way. It sort of has this 30 to 45 degree angle. And so you want to be in that plane because you have the best movement of your shoulder within the glenoid fossa or within that, that ball and socket joint. So this is called scaption. So just bringing your arm up this position is better than having your hand in because you're rotating your hand, closing your shoulder space. So moving in this direction, thumb up or thumb out to open up a bit. And then the serratus is a muscle that I think is important also to consider into an exercise program that's if you're doing independent transfers or if you're doing press-ups for um, pressure relief. And the serratus is the one that does, you know, typically if you have your arms extended, it's the one that extends you a little bit further, sort of protracts or brings your shoulder blades apart. Um, and that's used oftentimes in that last little bit of a transfer and it's important to, to exercise. One way that you can do it is even just having your hand here, you know, and resisting up against this, this band here. So those are the we talked a little bit about this, sort of the strengthening exercises that I would look at and consider for an exercise program would be these exercises because you're dealing mostly with the posterior part of your shoulder complex and you're working on opening up the anterior part. And these are also the muscles that are most involved with both transfers, wheelchair propulsion, and uh, positioning. So frequency. Um, as you saw in the study, there were some of them that did it three days a week, some of them that did it daily. Some of the protocols suggested that you do it two times a day. Some of them suggested you didn't do any flexibility. So they were sort of all over the place. And I think there's no really one set prescription for how many exercises or how many repetitions is the right number of repetitions. The first thing that you want to avoid is that you don't want to be causing pain. Your exercises are not meant to be painful. You really need to make sure that you're doing your exercises with good quality so you're preventing more pain. If you have pain, you want to be considering how you can alter that position and still get that muscle to work without causing uh, some of this discomfort. So I, I tend to go back towards the Academy of Sports Medicine guidelines where you're looking at three to five days as a minimum for stretching to keeping flexibility within the joint and then two to three days for strengthening is what they're recommending. If you're able to do a couple more, I think that would be great. I don't think that you have to do seven days a week. I think it's important to give your muscles a rest as you're going. You want your muscles to recover. You are using your muscles all the time, every day, during your propulsion and during your, strength, your, your daily activities, that they do need a little bit of a break. So aerobic exercise, we didn't really talk too much about that today. Again, I think it's a whole other 
topic, but certainly fitting that into a couple times a week is also part of the sports medicine guidelines to be able to do that. As far as duration of hold for a stretch, um, again, that sort of varies also through the literature. One of the things that, I think there was a study a number of years back, I think it's good 10 or 15 years, that talked about you needed to hold a stretch for about 30 seconds minimum to show any change in muscle fiber sort of uh, lengthening. So you don't want to just do, oh yeah, I'm good, good stretch, you know, reach it out. You really want to hold it. And I recommend be, uh, between 20 and 30 seconds is a nice prolonged hold. You don't want to be bouncing. You don't want to sort of go back and forth, you know, against your stretch. It doesn't really do much for the joint and it sometimes can cause some trauma to that area. So nice, slow, prolonged hold. You want to bring it to the point where you feel the stretch, but it's not painful. So you feel a little bit of tension, so you know you're doing something, but you're not hurting yourself or causing more pain. As far as strengthening exercises, again, that last study talked a little bit about these hypertrophy or these muscles that you want to really bulk up and the muscles that you want to use for endurance. I think there's very few muscles that you really want to bulk up in a after a spinal cord injury. You really want to make sure that you stay balanced anterior posteriorly, your, that your posture is good. If you're bulking up your pectoralis major, major your front of your, your body, and this is the only muscle that you're using for hypertrophy, you, you're going to have sort of a mismatch. You're going to be off balance. So you really want to make sure that you're, I would, I would emphasize more of the hypertrophy for the muscles in the back than the muscles in the front. Very rarely do we give that many bicep activities. You know, I think bicep curls is sort of the ultimate, what you do in the gym, you lift up, you know, the weight and go up and down like this, but you're using your biceps so frequently and you need them to stay stretched that we don't want to shorten them. We don't want to get them so big that they can't extend all the way out or that they can't do that last bit of that transfer because they're so big or bulky. So really using some of these muscles more for the endurance that you're using all day long, every day. Um, nice, good endurance activity. So when I think about endurance strengthening, I think about a lower resistance and a higher repetition. So you may do just five pounds, but you do it for 15 repetitions instead of 30 pounds at five repetitions or three or four repetitions. So you're doing your lower weight, higher repetition for endurance, high weight, low repetition for muscle hypertrophy. Um, and I would really get some recommendations from your therapist or from your physician about which muscles you should really hypertrophy if you're really wanting to go into sort of a bodybuilding or bulking type of phase. Because I think it could be, I, w I would err on the side of the endurance exercise for almost everything. So, does anybody have any questions? This is a question about the type of shoulder pain um, that they had in the studies, I'm assuming, sort of whether it was impingement, whether it was rotator cuff injury, whether it was just general. Um, most of the studies did not have a specific number of patients that had this impingement or had a dif differential diagnosis. They used the wheelchair user's shoulder pain in index to quantify it based on the gradient of pain b during their functional activities or during their transfer, during their sleeping. So I didn't, look, I didn't see too many that were really specific that this was mostly a rotator cuff injury or this was an impingement. So the question is whether or not you should, the first picture that we showed on the, the video was a sleeping position where you had your hand, one hand back in this position and one arm out to the side. And the question is whether or not you need to alternate or which arm do you put in what position if one arm is more painful than the other. And there is no, I, I wouldn't worry about which arm you're putting where. Some people are going to be more painful in this position and some people are going to be more painful in this position. I would try to switch if you're able to each time that you're turning, that you're changing a position or you're moving your arms in a different direction. But as far as where you have the pain, I think it's going to be dependent on how you're positioned in bed. I, you know, I think of probably people have less pain in this position than they have in this position because this is a little bit tighter on the shoulder joint itself. A little bit harder to get to, so. But you still want one arm in that position. If, or you could have one arm out here too. You could have both arms out to the side. But you, you, you know, this might be harder as well when we talked about sharing a bed with somebody too or having a single bed versus a, a full size bed. It might be difficult to do that. So the question is, um, in my practice, whether or not I've had people that adhere to what we teach them and if so, have they gotten any relief from any of the exercises? And I'd like to think that everybody listens to what we say, but I don't think that's always the case, or maybe they listen and then it's hard to sort of implement because as you guys all know, it's hard to 
implement activities into your daily lifestyle, whether you're injured or not injured, you know, getting to the gym every day or being able to exercise every day. So I think the patients that I've had that have had a lot of pain or have had significant pain that they didn't have pain, then they had this pain, are very motivated to get back to where they were because they knew how much more independent they were. They had that goal, they had that idealization of what they could do. And then it was easy to have them stay motivated and they saw great results. I think if you have a chronic level of pain and you're doing these exercises to just get minor relief but yet you still have this underlying pain, it's really hard to stay focused, I think, on your exercises. I've seen people sort of taper on and off a little bit more. Um, but I would recommend that if you do have a chronic pain, the, the most important one is the stretching. You know, really making sure you're staying flexible because it really impacts the amount of tension and the amount of pain that you have in your shoulder joint and sort of in your whole anterior trunk complex. So, you know, a lot, that is always a big challenge. I think the barriers to exercise are enormous. Um, we certainly have been trying to work closely with some of the gyms in the local community to make wheelchair accessible equipment. I know our recreation therapist has been out a number of times to different facilities and talking about how people can get involved or sort of be able to integrate into that. So there's that setting that you could look into if you have that close by your home. Or um, the, the transitions program here at the UW and Harborview has an exercise class, but it's sort of time limited. You know, it's just sort of to get revamped on an exercise program. It's not sort of an ongoing, long lasting, you know, continual exercise group. So, um, it, is, it is a challenge. They, I think you know, one, one strategy that I found really helpful for people is if they make it an achievable goal or say, all I need to do is 10 minutes of my day is to do this, these stretches or to do these strengthening exercises and say, I, I have 10 minutes and you set a timer. And at the end of that timer, if you're not done with all of them, you're done for the day. You, know, you, you did what you needed to do. You got something done. You set a limit to it and you can move on with the rest of your work or your activity for the day is, a, is one way that you can tackle that. Um, I think the, the other way is sort, sort of finding a friend or finding a buddy to be able to exercise with. We certainly see more success with people that have somebody to, to do this with or to be able to engage in an exercise program. And that could be through this group. It could be through, you know, an email group. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. It's a hard to, to find that perfect, perfect niche to be able to exercise. So the, the question is about what colors of the TheraBand are the mildest colors to the most difficult. Each TheraBand has a different level of tension. The lightest amount of tension most of the time, every, there's a couple different brands that make TheraBand, um, is yellow, is the lowest resistance. It goes yellow, red, green, blue, black, which is sort of well, the spectrum, uh, I think, of um, rainbow. So. You would use some of the lower resistance bands. So, and then, or, and then for bigger strengthening, you might use a higher resistance one. The other thing you can do is you could have a band that's really long, and you could do really short hypertrophy, and then extend it out a little bit to do more endurance, because you don't have quite as much resistance. Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, um, when's the best time to stretch? Is it better to do it in the morning or the evening, or when do you get the most out of your stretching? And um, I don't know that there's any science behind it, um, so I haven't seen any literature that talks about what time of day is the best time of day. I find that the greatest amount of stretching is when you get a little bit warmed up, so that you've been moving around a little bit or you've taken a shower, somehow sort of get some motion in your body, not just flat out wake up out of bed. Um, and start to stretch. So I would suggest doing it either after an activity or after you sort of have started moving around in the morning, just breakfast, after breakfast wise. The is, question is, is there TheraBand latex free? And this TheraBand is not, but there is some TheraBand that, that is latex free. Um, so the question is whether or not to get a hand cycle, um, knowing that you have a chronic history of shoulder pain in both sides. Um, I think that's definitely a pretty unique question. I think it's going to be very particular to you whether or not how much motion you have, how much pain you have, how far you have to reach to be able to move the hand cycle. So there's some hand cycles that are out there that are more of like an upright, more like a tricycle type of where you have, you're a little bit closer to the hand controls. And then there's some that are more on the racing category where you're sitting very low, it's hard to transfer into, and you're a little bit more extended, um, you know, with your arms. There are some adjustments in that, but 
I would not get a hand cycle that caused you shoulder pain. So if you're trying hand cycles and with every revolution you're getting discomfort, then it's not going to help you overcome that discomfort. I think it's just probably going to exacerbate um, that. So you really have to sort of pick and choose. And there's lots of them out there. Um, so there's certainly some possibilities. Um, but you, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're always causing the pain to reoccur. That's a good question. The, uh, she asked me to comment on sh uh, shoulder issues for walker users. And um, again, I think the same way that the shoulder joint is used for transfers when it's typically not a weight-bearing joint, you're definitely putting more stress and more weight down through your shoulders as you're using the walker. If you are putting so much weight down through the walker that it's causing you pain as you're using the walker, you may want to consider either a, a walker that has four wheels that could potentially be a little bit easier to maneuver, although that has some trouble because it tends to be a little bit more squirrely or moving around. Um, and then you also want to, or if there's another device that you could use that would give you a break so you're not putting so much stress or so much pressure on. If you have so much pressure for an extended period of time, say you're walking half a mile and it's really sore by the end of that, it's probably not a good idea to push yourself through endurance distance like that, that you would take frequent breaks and sort of rest, rest your hands, rest your arms as you're moving. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our speaker, Kristen.